So agents have to calculate some level of utility for each project. Uh, so I've shown you a, a utility function there. This is basically a guess of what is important to agents when they are uh, uh, selecting projects. Uh, first term, okay, it says how similar does the project and agent have to be? How, you know, how close do the interests have to match? Second is looking at the current popularity. Is there a lot of work being done on this project? Is that important? We need a project that's active right now, or is that not so important? Third is the size of projects. I mean, are, are people inherently interested in small projects, medium projects, large projects? Uh, fourth is looking at how popular is it with consumers? Okay, how many users does this project have? Do I want to pick a project to work on that has a lot of other users, or maybe it doesn't matter? And finally, the maturity, which gives you, <laughs> gives me an idea on you know, how far along is this project in functionality? Is it working, or is it still kind of really early in the alpha stage and probably doesn't do what I need it to do yet? We need an, uh, a way to figure out what each one of those uh, uh, maturity stages meant in regards to the importance. Uh, so what we did is, as a proxy, we looked at the number of new developers that joined projects in each one of those stages, which you can see there on the right-hand side. Essentially, when projects are, are up here in the planning stage, is when you have the most new developers. Right? And that's kind of a funny stage because you know things are just getting started up and everything. What you see is it kind of drops off from that point. Uh, and unfortunately, in the data set that we had, uh, it got whittled down to only three projects that ever even made it to the mature stage, and none of those received new developers, which is why you have zero value for when projects get to mature. Uh, that could be a problem again with the data simply because we did not have much in the way of, of projects that made it to the mature stage. So when agents choose to uh, contribute or uh, uh, download a project, which again is based on the consuming or producing number, uh, basically we're using imperfect choice here uh, so that we can vary <laughs> whether or not an uh, agent is choosing the uh, project that has the maximum utility or a project that's close to the maximum utility or, for example, just totally flat level L projects that it knows about have the same probability of being chosen. So here's what's nice about uh, uh, this public good, is that there are a bunch of data sources for calibration. Okay? There have been a number of surveys in literature. Uh, for example, uh, some of the data you've seen already used in this has come from surveys or literature that other people have done. Floss hosting sites, uh, SourceForge is the major one. I checked how many things were, uh, uh, how many projects were registered yesterday. We're up to 258,000. Okay? So it's, it's quite a few data points. And there are other data uh, forges as well although SourceForge is by far the biggest and most popular. Uh, then as was also mentioned, there's some databases already available. Uh, the first one there called Floss Mold is really kind of neat because it's an open source project in and of itself. Its whole purpose is to grab data from other forges and make it available, but it's all done under open source license. Uh, Floss Metrics is a similar project. Uh, it's coming out of the European Union where they're looking at some different things, uh, mining some logs and whatnot, for example, in regards to source code, uh, so source code repositories and whatnot. And of course, was mentioned, uh, University of Notre Dame maintains a database that are source forge dumps as well. Finally, if the data isn't available, you always have the option to write your own crawlers or extraction tools, uh, one such as CVS and L2. Uh, everything with a green check mark there was used in, in doing this kind of, kind of work. Uh, so just some examples of the kind of data that had to be extracted. For example, this gives you an idea of what the rate is that the uh, uh, growth on SourceForge is, the rate that projects are being added. Right-hand side is, is showing you the number of commits. Uh, we needed some idea on, on when to move a project, when to categorize a project in each one of the maturity stages, and we're doing that based on the number of commits that occurred, mining that from real data. So you can see, for example, that the bulk of the work is done in the alpha and beta. So for testing, uh, we run the, uh, the simulation for 750 time steps uh, because it's a stochastic process. We do it multiple times and average the results. Uh, we would like to validate the model, prove that it's reproducing something that's, that's reasonable. So we do it on three properties. Uh, we look at the number of projects in the maturity stages. We look at the developers per projects distribution and the projects per developer distribution. Uh, unfortunately for some of the parameters, we do not know what, uh, what those are, and we have no way of mining it from the existing data. So what we end up using is genetic algorithms to kind of explore the state space, and then hopefully we can gain some insight into what the values are that work best and give us a little better idea of what's going on in the model. Uh, so for the development stage, as you can see, most uh, projects are in the rather low stages. Very few actually get to the mature stage. 
Uh, but the model manages to, in fact, uh, reproduce this very well when we take the, the uh, parameter runs that work very well. This would be a sample of the best run that we managed to get. Uh, developers per project, you've seen essentially how biased this is. Okay, most projects have a single uh, 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 developer that's working on it. Uh, right hand side is giving it to a logarithmic scale so you can see better how this actually lines up. Again, we're doing a relatively good job of reproducing this. And when you get to the right hand side, you kind of get in the noise anyhow because there are so few projects that, for example, have 40 or 50 developers working on it anyhow. Uh, so it's, it's kind of in the noise. Uh, finally, if we look at the projects per developer, <laughs> again, uh, not a real big surprise, but uh, most developers are working on just one or two projects. Okay? Again, this is largely volunteer, so not a very big surprise, but we are in fact able to match this distribution as well. So everything looks good there. So now we look at some of the evolved parameters. Uh, I'm just going to talk about a few of these. First, we're going to look at the producer and consumer numbers. Remember, this was what is the propensity of an agent to actually uh, develop or to consume open source projects. We assumed it was normally distributed, but we don't know what the mean is and we don't know what the standard deviation is. So if you look at the uh, producer number, you see that the mean is very, very high and very stable, and the standard deviation is very low and relatively stable. So basically it says in the best model runs, okay, most of the agents are producing most of the time. Okay? What that tells us is the developers are very important to reproducing the data, and that perhaps open source is very much developer driven. On the other hand, if you look at the consumer, same sort of data, okay, but the mean is rather low, all right, and it's not very stable. The standard deviation, rather high, and again, it's very stable. So it says for the model bar runs that performed well, it really was all over the place. So essentially from this, we conclude that consumers didn't matter so much. Developers did, consumers did not. We also want to look at what the weights were for the utility function, which I've got there down on the bottom to remind you what it is again. Uh, unfortunately, not, not all solutions came together to be identical, so we did a little cluster analysis of it. And what we found across the clusters is, in general, the cumulative resources and the maturity were high values. Those weights were high, so those were important for developers when they were selecting projects. Sometimes important were the current resources, and typically unimportant were the, were the similarity Okay, in general, we found very low values for similarity. That wasn't important. Uh, and the downloads, okay, again, and that traces back to the consumers don't seem to be a driving force in this. Uh, one more thing that we wanted to look at was in regards to success, success metrics. Okay, obviously there are a number of success metrics proposed, but do they essentially all measure the same thing, or are they measuring different things? So we took one of the model runs, <coughs> excuse me, we took a number of the model runs, and we defined some success metrics and categorized the projects that we got. Uh, so maturity threshold is simply saying, if you've hit a beta stage or better, essentially you've created some, some useful functional software we're going to consider you successful. Change of maturity essentially is saying that in some given amount of time you need to be moving from maturity stages, demonstrating that the software is in fact progressing. Uh, change in developer, same sort of idea. You have to have an increasing number of developers over a time period. Change in downloads, you need to see an increase in downloads. Uh, change in percent complete, you have to see so much of the project complete per time step. Uh, and finally, a very simple metric is just looking at how many projects in fact are complete. You can see from those numbers, they're all over the place with the largest uh, percentage being almost 40% of the projects, <coughs> smallest being 0.01%. All right, so the question is, are these still all essentially the same? It's just that some are more sensitive and less sensitive. It's just where we set the threshold. The answer is no, because what we did is we uh, went ahead and computed the Jacquard similarity between these sets. And you will see that most of those values are rather low, essentially saying that if you take the two sets and compare them, there's very little overlap between the two. Okay. So essentially what we found through this model so far, uh, number one is, Although I like to talk about all the data that's available, we spent a tremendous amount of time dealing with dirty data. Okay, it looks like the data is great. You start looking at it seriously, you find there are all sorts of problems. But that's a very big problem with this. Even though the data is available and it's a natural thing that's being collected with uh, uh, any of the digital type commons, you have to be really skeptical about what you're looking at. We also basically showed that uh, open source is developer driven and not so much consumer driven. Uh, that's in line with what some other people have written about, but nobody's really been able to test that or prove that. We're happy that the model, in fact, gives good agreement with that. We've shown what factors are potentially important in this model, what the weights are uh, in regards to people 
uh, choosing projects that manage to reproduce the empirical data. And we've also shown that success metrics do matter. Okay, it's not just a matter of grabbing any of these success metrics and expect it to work as well as the other ones. It does, in fact, make a difference. And so, therefore, uh, perhaps the recommendation is that you need to use multiple success metrics when considering what projects are successful, what projects are not. For future work, we would like to take this uh, to the next level and look at what projects are successful in the model, all right, and then maybe do some level of cluster analysis or look at some level of similarity to try and understand what differentiates the projects that are being successful in the model from all the other projects that essentially are stagnant. Right. That's it.